Now, just to get you started, to help you take you back into the early 19th century, I'd like to introduce you to this little model uh, here that you can see is not finished, and that is a model of HMS Beagle, which is the naval vessel in which Darwin travelled around the world from 1831 to 1836. And having it here serves two functions. One is it reflects uh, my lifelong interest in Darwin and evolution. Uh, my sons kindly conspired together to buy this for me a little while back, and it makes a per perfect retirement present because you have to build it one plank at a time, <laughs> and uh, that's why it's not finished. But more importantly, how it helps us is if you think of that and think of yourself as Darwin travelling around the world at the age of 22, you spend five years uh, on the ship and, of course, on lots of places on land. <clears throat> so that's the equivalent of doing both a master's and a PhD study on this boat uh, as the companion to a captain who was not known for his evenness of temper. And so just try and transport yourself back mentally and think how you would think if you were doing that postgraduate study under those circumstances. And, uh, for instance, one little thing that tells you that what a different world this is is imagine writing a risk assessment for the Beagle voyage. <laughs> a different world, OK? Now, in order to go back to a different world like that successfully, it's a bit like going out into the bush you do not want to take too much baggage with you. And in the case of a successful journey back into the past, the sort of baggage that you don't want to take with you are your current assumptions or, dare I say, prejudices. Because what's so easy to do, there's a real danger of rewriting history so as to produce the sorts of heroes and maybe villains that we want to see. So you get in there and you rewrite history and you tell the story the way you want to see according to your presumptions. And if I could just turn to fiction for a moment to illustrate that, there's a, a nice example from the works of Jane Austen, who I hope you're all familiar with, and indeed her novels illustrate the social situation into which Darwin was born rather well. And her most famous novel, I'm sure you know, is Pride and Prejudice, and on television earlier this year, there was a lovely comedy about uh, a girl by the name of Amanda Price who was besotted with Pride and Prejudice and, of course, with the rich and handsome Mr Darcy. And one evening, she opened a mysterious door in her wardrobe and found herself in their house, back in that story. And, of course, knowing Pride and Prejudice off by heart, she knew what ought to happen, but her presence there started to mess things up. So she tried to put them back the way they should be, and the harder she worked at that, the worse things got out of control. And so it was sorted in the end, but it was a beautiful comedy that uh, makes that point for us. The more we think we know how history should be written and try and go in there and make it fit our views, the more we stuff it up. Now, professional historians have all sorts of fancy words like anachronism for that. Let us just call it the Amanda Price effect, OK? <laughs> And so you just have to really get into your minds, with the help of the Beagle, I hope, that you're moving into a different world from where we are at the present time. So one of the problems with all these celebrations, great though they are, is that with media hype and the myths that are around, we tend to get this impression of Darwin as some superman who suddenly appeared from nowhere and altered the way we think. And so one of the main things, the key points I want to get across in this lecture, is that it wasn't like that. Darwin did not live and work in the vacuum, but in a particular set of circumstances that led to the publication of The Origin of Species. So, let's first of all ask ourselves, what were Darwin's personal qualities that he contributed OK, so someone who achieves as much as he is, uh, he must have some special qualities that he brought to this. And the first is his family background. Darwin was raised in a family with strong Enlightenment values. Uh, that's in reason and scholarship and uh, study, arriving at conclusions for yourself, that sort of thing. 
and particularly his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who was a significant intellect in England in the late 18th century. And he was a remarkable character. He was uh, technically a physician, but as well as being an excellent doctor, he had heaps of other interests that ranged from steam engine to botany. And in the area of botany, he wrote a book called The Botanic Garden, but unconventional as he was, instead of writing a textbook, he wrote a poem. And so there was this excellent poem called The Botanic Garden. And uh, a little thing that you may not know, he was sufficiently appreciated for that, uh, that a genus of plants was named after him in the early 19th century, Darwinias. And this drawing was kindly done for me by Peter Nish, who used to study here in the botany department. And what you may not know further is that Darwinias are a native Australian plant, and so, of course, I have some Darwinias outside my study window at home, and here is the real thing, just to show you what they look like. Okay, so Darwin had as a grandfather someone who was sufficiently distinguished to get plants named after him to contribute to the study of botany and also to promote the idea of evolution. Uh, in the 1790s, he wrote another poem called Zoonomia, about the laws of organic life, as he called them, in which he put forward the idea of evolution and in yet another book published just after his death, he rarely expounded evolution on the grand scale. So Darwin had a family there that was led naturally to his sorts of interests. If we look at Charles Darwin himself, he tells us in his autobiography that he was keen on natural history by the time he was aged 10. And he says he had a passion for collecting and specifically mentions birds and insects that he used to collect at the school he was sent to, which was uh, kind of not quite a primary school. It went a bit beyond. Uh, but uh, at the, by the age of 10, he developed this passion for collecting. And uh, what you find is that this developed into a passion for detailed observation and understanding what was going on. So he moved on from just collecting to observing for himself and trying to work out uh, what it all meant. And uh, there's a couple of nice quotes that illustrate this. One is from his uncle Josiah Wedgwood. When Darwin was trying to go on the Beagle voyage, his father was not convinced that this was a useful activity for the young man to do. And his uncle Josiah defended it as useful to him as a man of enlarged understanding. Now, I think that's a perfect description of Charles Darwin, a man of enlarged understanding, and one that I'm sure he would have accepted himself. And then it was the Beagle voyage that turned him from an enthusiastic youth into a scientist of real calibre. He was there on deck doing the stuff, he had to work at it and get it done. And uh, again in his autobiography, <clears throat> looking back on the Beagle voyage, he says, I can now perceive how my love of science gradually preponderated over every other taste. And I like this bit, especially for us in this neck of the woods. I discovered that the pleasure of observing and reasoning was much greater one than that of skill and sport. So I think those make a perfect illustration of uh, Darwin's, the special character that Darwin brought to this, <clears throat> that if you take those three quotes, first of all, early on, a passion for collecting was where he started. Then he grew into a young man of enlarged, understand, enlarged curiosity, I beg your pardon, and then when he was given the opportunity, he developed that passion for science, for observation and reasoning. And I think that's really important to keep that in mind as to who Darwin was. Um, you know, Darwin gets... Uh, everybody wants their share of him these days, whether it's historians, philosophers, sociologists, artists, everybody. But I reckon you'll never understand Darwin unless you can empathise with that absolute passion he had 
for the natural world of animals and plants and wanting to understand them. If you've never had a passion for collecting insects or whatever, uh, it's very hard to actually understand that that was what drove Darwin uh, to his achievements. So let's keep that in mind. <clears throat> That's the special quality, uh, his family and his own special quality that Darwin brought to his studies. Now for people who accomplish great things like Darwin, as well as having those outstanding abilities that he had, it's always nearly always the case that they receive a lot of encouragement. True of Jane Austen, for example. It's also true of uh, Darwin himself. And he received <coughs> encouragement which I've classified under two areas. One is a general encouragement just from the society in which he lived. And we can see this acknowledged... Uh, <coughs> If you look at that, I know it's not readable, but the point I'm just making at the minute is that what he did when he published The Origin of Species is he put opposite the title page a couple of quotations that reflect the society in which he lived. It's really amusing if you read people's books who were not wealthy like Darwin and you see these groveling acknowledgements to wealthy patrons uh, facing the title page or just on the next page or whatever... Darwin was rich enough he had no need of that, but he makes an acknowledgement to the society in which he lived. And of those, I'll pick this second one, which is a quotation from Francis Bacon. And he wrote the book Advancement of Learning, was published in 1605, so just take a moment to enjoy this 17th century language. Here is a scholar writing about the importance of the advancement of learning way back then, and Darwin has put it on the origin of species as uh, <coughs> something that really supported him. What you can see going on in the work of Francis Bacon is that there is developing a positive link between the church and the development of science that in the church in Europe at those times there was a great reformation going on and also, more broadly, there was a renaissance of study of scholarship and inquiry of the advancement of learning. And in Francis Bacon what happens is that these two trends come together because he was not only a philosopher advancing uh, natural philosophy, that's science, and study, he was also a statesman with a significant figure in the court of place in the court of King James I. Now, about the time that this was written, King James I was sponsoring an authorised version of the Bible in English, which came out in 1611. And the point of that was so that people could study the Bible for themselves, have a look at it, and read it for themselves. What Bacon is doing is using a traditional metaphor. He didn't think this one up. The two books metaphor goes way back uh, centuries before and saying, OK, just as you have the opportunity to study God's word for yourself, so you have the opportunity which you should take to study God's works for yourself, to look at the works of nature, to look for yourself in both books, both scripture and nature. And he particularly develops this emphasis on looking for yourself, what today we would call empirical study, getting in there and finding the facts for yourself. And he did that because at that time, within the context of European society and the church, the great figures of the past were from classics. Aristotle was the dominant name and traditions and so on. And he's saying, never mind Aristotle and traditions, go and look for yourself. And he's able to say that with this quotation in the context of the Church of England. <clears throat> and so Darwin became very Baconian, especially in his early years, observing the facts as we've just seen, following up the facts, looking for yourself. He inherited uh, that tradition very much. He may not have been quite so keen on studying the Bible, but this part of Bacon's teaching uh, he followed absolutely. 
There's one other little encouragement that's in there that is unusual to England, and that is because of this kind of relationship in the Church of England, it was quite usual for clergymen in the church to have natural history or some branch of science as a hobby. So for the next couple of centuries, a lot of science was actually done by clergymen who took it up as a hobby and studied animals and plants or physics or astronomy or whatever. (coughs) And so that was still true uh, when Darwin was a young man that it was considered perfectly suitable for a clergyman to have natural history as a hobby. (coughs) So that's a general encouragement from society as a whole, from the Christian civilization in which he lived. In the case of England, some other places were different, but in England the relationship was positive. Now Darwin also had a great deal of quite personal encouragement, all right, encouragement one-to-one that applied to him in particular, not just of a society in general. And one such encouragement was his father, who actually believed in having him educated. Now that may sound odd, but uh, they were a wealthy family, and as Darwin grew up it was perfectly clear he wouldn't have to earn a living, he wouldn't be able to be an idle rich uh, as he inherited his father's wealth. But his father didn't want that, he wanted him to undertake some useful occupation. His father was again a doctor, (coughs) and so he looked to have Darwin educated. So Darwin went to this school, (coughs) as we've heard, and at that time the course of study that you did as a young boy at a school was to learn all about the classics. Aristotle, whose name I've just taken in vain, would have been big on the syllabus. The history of of those ancient times, the geography of Greece you had to know, and all that stuff. Darwin, we saw, was not one bit interested. Uh, Aristotle was as nothing to him compared to collecting insects. So now here's a nice bit example, like the beagle, of the different world in which we live. Because his father saw that Darwin was doing badly at school, so he sent him to university (laughs) to study medicine. Okay, so back then, that was the option. Off he went to Edinburgh with his brother to qualify to be a doctor like his father and grandfather. Now, he hated medicine, which is understandable, having to get up and be lectured to by someone dissecting a corpse at 8 o'clock on a winter's morning was something terrible to remember, uh, as he later told us. Uh, But he did meet one person there who really encouraged him with his interests in natural history and heading down the path he uh, wanted to go, and that was a man called Robert Grant, who was very much into natural history and there were local societies of scientists, amateur scientists, that he joined and he became really interested in marine zoology. So that's how come Darwin became interested in the little creatures that live on the seashore, round about it, and he even described one or two new things that got incorporated in uh, papers and books. So meeting Robert Grant really encouraged his interest in natural history particularly marine life. <clears throat> Another thing that Robert Grant did was to praise Lamarck. He was a very keen enthusiast of the Frenchman Lamarck's theory of evolution. So as well as hearing it handed down from his grandfather, Charles Darwin heard the general idea of evolution praised highly. He tells how one day he was out walking with Robert Grant when he suddenly burst out in this great exposition of what a wonderful man Lamarck was and what a wonderful idea Uh, his evolutionary theory was. So he was headed in that sort of direction in spite of uh, the studies he didn't like at Edinburgh. So it became clear to his father that he wasn't doing any better at Edinburgh than he had done at school, so then he decided to send him to Cambridge to become a clergyman. Sounds odd. But not so, if you remember what I said just five minutes ago, all right, that in then it was perfectly natural for a clergyman, say a country clergyman could spend a couple of days doing his duties, the rest of the time he could take up a hobby like natural history, and Charles Darwin was quite keen on that idea. That suited him quite well. And in fact, 
That's exactly what happened to him um, at... Uh, sorry, that's exactly what happened to his cousin, William Darwin Fox, who was at Cambridge with him. So Fox became a country clergyman and took up natural history in his spare time. So Darwin went to Cambridge and did a, a Bachelor of Arts degree, was the basic qualification for being a clergyman. We were supposed to chuck in a bit of theology as well, and uh, then that gave you the qualification to go into the church. Naturally, therefore, you can understand that Darwin was basically not interested in that syllabus at all, and there's a lovely remark that he makes in the, his autobiography looking back on it. He says, During the three years which I spent at Cambridge, my time was wasted, as far as academical studies were concerned, as completely as at Edinburgh and at school. See, so Darwin's a fascinating character, and again, a different world. As a student, a total failure, and yet, look what he accomplished. And that was because he didn't like any of the stuff on the official syllabus. He tells us that what gave him greatest pleasure out of everything, what he found most satisfying and pleasing at Cambridge, was collecting beetles. <laughs> so that was the real stuff, never mind all this arts and theology. But... He did also attend some science lectures. Now, back then, science was not part of a syllabus. There were just some public lectures, like the, this one and other ones that the university puts on here, that you could go to if you were interested as a student. So they were just extras that you could attend. And uh, Darwin did that, and in particular, he attended the lectures of Professor Henslow, who was a botanist. And just to remind you of what we were saying before, he was actually the Reverend John Henslow as well as the Professor John Henslow. And he was introduced to Henslow one-to-one -one by his cousin Darwin Fox and became a close friend. And that was an important link because, as he says himself, again from Darwin's autobiography, uh, <coughs> A circumstance which influenced my whole career more than any other was my friendship with Professor Henslow. All right, so grasp the importance of that. What he's saying is, more than any other circumstance, a friendship with his Professor Henslow was what influenced his whole career. How come? Well, he attended Henslow's lectures, so they can't have been too bad, but much more than that, he went on his field excursions, and if you know Cambridge at all, it's lovely and flat with rivers that you can go along on barges and stop where you feel like it, and they jump off and look at the plants and so on. So there were really enjoyable field excursions you could go to. In addition, through the introduction that he had to him, he was able to attend uh, John Henslow's open house. Again, a very different academic to today's world, once a week, he would have open house for his students and his colleagues who were interested in science to come along and attend. It was part of the way they were building up a little network of people who were interested in science and promoting it, even though it was not officially part of a syllabus. <coughs> and so Darwin went along to this and develop this close friendship, and in fact, on top of that even, he would often walk across campus with Henslow chatting about this or that of a scientific nature, and the ac academics at Cambridge eventually came to know him as the man who walks with Henslow. So that was a real friendship uh, that encouraged him on his way, and of course, in the end, that resulted in the invitation to take this journey on the Beagle. The Admiralty got in touch with uh, Henslow by a roundabout route because Captain Fitzroy genuinely wanted a companion. On the, it was a bit lonely being a captain, but he did want a companion who was interested in natural history and would collect interesting specimens and ship them back to England and so on. Again, probably not many naval captains today would uh, feel like that, but that was how things were then. And so when it came round to it... <coughs> 
Henslow recommended his favourite student to go on this voyage. Actually, he apparently thought of going on the, the voyage himself, but when he raised the matter at home, he only had to take one look at the expression on his wife's face to realise that the matter was settled in the negative. So, that strong friendship with Henslow built up his interest in science, uh, encouraged that curiosity, and got him his place on the Beagle. So that was really important, and one interesting lesson we learned from that is that without the Henslows, there are no Darwins. <laughs>